you want to welcome Dan. Hi, thanks a lot, Jonathan. Um, hi, I'm Dan Goman. I work at Mozilla on WebAssembly and more WebAssembly and lots of WebAssembly stuff. Um, so I'm here to talk about WebAssembly beyond the browser. This is a little bit weird talk for uh, Mozilla to talk about because Mozilla really cares about the web. Um, but we really care about WASI. We really care about taking WebAssembly beyond the browser because we think that's actually a really key port for uh, making the overall WebAssembly ecosystem stronger, which in turn will make the web stronger. So this is actually a really big port for our big picture. So I'm going to start out talking about the background of, of WASI and really how do we get to the place where we are in terms of the current thing that we call WASI. So what are the big shapes of computing? What are the big shapes of, of the world, really, is platforms. We think a lot about platforms, and what does this mean? Um, when two things come together, they have to have a way of coming together, and platforms are sort of this joining point, and platforms end up meaning a lot of things. Um, we're specifically talking about computing platforms, and computing platforms are kind of this point where two programs or, or two pieces of software can come together in a standardized or a conventional way to talk to each other. Computing platforms are really important in terms of computing, obviously. Um, and zooming in a little bit more, we're going to talk about general purpose computing platforms. So general purpose. Um, there are a lot of computing platforms out there that deal with things like signal processing, um, neural nets, special purpose things that typically have special purpose hardware. Um, but if we look at the majority of software in the world, most of the things we look at is general purpose. It's, it's running on uh, commodity CPUs. It's running on commodity operating systems, um, general purpose stuff. And so with WebAssembly, WebAssembly is primarily targeting general purpose computation. It doesn't have a lot of the super specialized features. Um, it's not even a GPU language as, as of right now. It's just a general purpose computing language. And so zooming in a little bit more, inside a platform, one of the key parts that makes a platform is the language. So for a compute language, we want to be able to compute things. Um, this is the language which makes the platform useful. You can do things with it. You can write programs. You can execute programs. Um, and languages are a lot of fun. I work on compilers and other stuff. Um, and, and languages are a lot of fun to work on. Programming languages, ISAs, bytecodes, a lot of different things that are different kind of languages. They all are serve their particular place within the platform of being the vehicle by which programs can be executed. There's a surprise. As fun as, as languages are to talk about, um, Languages aren't even the main show. We talk about platforms and what makes a platform, what makes a platform tick, what can you do with it, what does it look like, how does it fit into the world. Languages, as fun as they are to talk about, as much attention they get, um, are, are not even that important, really, in the big picture. Um, as an example of that, I'm going to talk about ASM.js a little bit. So ASM.js um, is this crazy thing, which is um, a subset of JavaScript that Mozilla invented back in the day. Um, it has a really crazy syntax. I saw the little states of it on the screen here. Um, ASM.js is a subset of JavaScript that essentially allows you to pretend that JavaScript has a static type system. And if you follow all the rules very carefully, um, then the consumer side can treat it like it has a static type system and can compile it to a very efficient piece of code. Now, if we think that a platform is all about the language, you might think that a language, a platform with a really crazy bytecode like ASM.js wouldn't work very well. Uh, but in practice, ASM.js worked out really well. It worked out phenomenally well. In fact, it worked out so well, you could run 3D games, you could do a lot of other cool stuff with it. And ASM.js worked out so well, it's actually a big part of why we have WebAssembly today. And so we really have to be careful when you think about platforms, talking about the language of the platform um, is often not even the most important part. So what matters? The API. The APIs are really what delivers the personality, the guts, the soul of the platform. The reason why ASM.js successful, ASM.js was so successful, um, there were a lot of reasons for it. But one of the big reasons that doesn't get as much attention as the other ones um, is that it reused the existing API of the web platform. We can talk a lot about the bytecode and how things actually worked and turn the compiler. Those are a lot of fun to talk about. I work on compilers like this; is a lot of fun. But the API was really the thing where the, all the action is, and so that's why I'm here talking about APIs today. So this phrase we hear a lot today, universal platform, people talk about it a lot. What does it really mean? Is WebAssembly a universal platform? Does, that, is it, does it satisfy our, our conditions? Part of being a universal platform is being a platform. And part of being a platform is having an API. And so within the web, we have the web APIs. We have the DOM, we have HTML, we have CSS. Um, 
We have WebGL, we have all the other great things that go with that. And so with the web, WebAssembly isn't the platform. The web is the platform, and WebAssembly just extends what you can do with the web. Outside the web, we don't necessarily have web APIs anymore. There's no there's not a browser there. That's what we mean by non-web WASM. It's really that there's no browser there. So we don't have this sort of pre-existing set of like, here's how you do everything. Here's how you display text. Here's how you display graphics. Here's how you play sound. Here's how you make network connections. Those aren't all pre-provided for us. In fact, some of the things that browsers do in this space aren't actually desirable for us here. So browsers are very paranoid about allowing programs to open up sockets. So there's no API for like making a raw TCP socket. We have this thing called WebSockets. But in the non-web space, that's too restrictive. We need our own APIs. And so the way WebAssembly was designed from the beginning, um, the designers knew it was going to be on the web and we're going to use web APIs. And they knew it was going to be non-web. That goes all the way back. You can see the documents from that in the, in the design repo. You can see the non-web web.asm.md there. Um, but they didn't know what the APIs were supposed to look like. So the design for Webassem was very carefully designed to exclude any kind of concept of what are the APIs, because that's going to take a lot of work to design. So another part of this story is Emscripten. I want to talk about how Emscripten fits into all this, too. So Emscripten really made a name for itself and really changed a lot of parts of computing by doing what people thought was impossible. The basic premise of Emscripten when it came on the scene was we're going to compile C++ into JavaScript. And the common wisdom at the time was like, oh my goodness, that's just impossible. You're not going to do that. That's not going to work. Or, or somehow if it does, if you somehow make it work, it's not going to be fast. Or, or even if you somehow make it fast, you know, it's, it's not going to have all the features. It's not really going to work. You're not really going to build real programs. You don't really want to use this thing. Emscripten um, proved it all wrong. It made it happen. But that also shaped what Emscripten became. It shaped how Emscripten works. Emscripten entered the world where a lot of the open source tools weren't what it needed, because no one else thought you could do this at all. And so Emscripten had to pull everything in and become this sort of monolithic thing that does everything for you, which was great in an era when that's all you had. But we're looking outside the web now. We're looking at a space when people assume that what we're doing is easy. This is the opposite of what WebAssembly had, or what Emscripten had. Emscripten had what you're doing should be impossible. Where we're going, everyone thinks this is easy and wonders why we don't have those stuff done yet. So Rich Hickey has this talk. Um, you can find it if you Google it. Uh, simple versus easy. It's not exactly what he calls it. He's talking about software development. He's talking about the difference between simple and easy. Where simple basically means uncomplex, not different concerns mixed together. It means one thing, just doing one thing at a time. Really, sort of the fundamental English, meaning of English word simple is just one thing, not tied in with other things at once. Um, and easy is related to simple, but easy has more to do with what is, the, what is the distance from where I am to where I want to go and how hard it's going to be for me to get there. Um, easy things might be very complex. Um, and this is the case with Emscripten. Emscripten makes things easy. It focuses a lot on emulation. One of Emscripten's tasks was to focus on porting large C++ game engines. Um, and in fact, it still is this task. This is what it does today very well. And it's very easy to do this because Emscripten has a lot of services for emulating a PC, pretending like the web is a big PC, and then filling out all the gaps. So on a PC, you might have a graphic stack that talks to OpenGL, C++ API, um, and the web has WebGL which has a lot of the same features, but it's actually quite a lot different. And so Emscripten has a lot of glue to present a C++-like API to the application. Emscripten also comes with things like a file system, because that's what you would have on a desktop. We're emulating a desktop environment within the web, so we have a file system. Um, but one of the things that Rich talks about in this is talk about simple versus easy is that easy can be deceptive. Easy is sort of easy in the short term. Um, over the long term, easy can actually make things harder. So with the Emscripten example, using the file system as an emulation of a PC platform actually kind of makes things more complicated in the long term. Because now, if you have a game with a lot of assets in a native context, those assets might just be installed on the file system. And you just expect them to be there. You expect that you can read them quickly. But in a web context, what's going to happen is that Emscripten is going to take all of your assets and bundle them up in a file system image. 
and they're going to download that whole image before you can even start your game. That's not a great experience. And it comes from the fact that you're emulating the platform. You're not actually presenting the true shape of the platform to the application. Emulation has its place. It's actually really great that we can port applications and, and large game engines and other things to the web really easily. Very great tool. But if we want to talk about making WebAssembly the best popular platform we can make it, um, and, and non-Web WASM, we want to really have a core foundation that's not an emulation of something else. It has to be true to what WASM is. WASM turns out to be a fairly opinionated platform. And if we emulate other things on top of it, which we can do, and it has a place, we don't get the most out of what WebAssembly can actually do. So emulation of other platforms makes things easy, has a place. What we want is to make WASM simple. And there's still a place for emulation. We still want to do emulation, but we see the, the real big role for emulation is to be a layer on top. We need to make a real platform for WASM, which is a WASM native platform, is how I think of it. WASM native, meaning instead of trying to pretend that we have things like POSIX, you know, Unix domain sockets, or POSIX shared memory, um, other things, we want to expose the WASM ways of communicating. WASM has things like imports and exports, which can do a lot of the same things in a very different way. These are the true capabilities of the platform. So POSIX. POSIX is basically the, the standardized version of, of the Unix interface. Um, POSIX kind of stands out as kind of the obvious answer. It's, it's a lot of stuff, in, a lot of people, including myself, thought of for a long time was like, well, this will be the obvious thing that we'll do for APIs when it comes to non-web APIs. We'll just look at POSIX because you know, what else are you going to do? POSIX is, is the answer. Um, it's a standard. It's one of the very few sort of system interface, little system interfaces thing that's actually a standard. And it's actually fairly well understood, fairly simple, um, fairly easy to implement in a lot of places, and a lot of applications support it. So POSIX kind of stands out. It's like, this is the obvious way to do it. Um, as a minor detail, POSIX ended up being a C API rather than just like a direct system call API. Um, and so there'd be some work we have to do. Um, and so at Mozilla, we coined this term called POSIX for thinking about this concept of taking POSIX and mapping it into WebAssembly in the most obvious way. But this still doesn't get us all the way. This, isn't, this still doesn't really get to the point where we have a WebAssembly native interface. Um, because when you, when you go down this path, then the, the, the immediate thing, the path sort of lays itself out for you. Once you have a, a POSIX kind of a POSIX binding, um, people start talking about, like, let's port, port all these existing programs, the Unix user space, because it's all just POSIX, so everything should just port without modifications. Um, and it'd be really cool. Like a, a Debian port to Plasma would be really kind of fun. Um, imagine running a Debian thing in your, in your browser. People have done it before, but you can't do it today um, with, with WASM. But this would be an emulation. This would be not exposing the true capabilities of the platform. Um, and one of the sort of signs of that, the obvious mascot of this whole problem is Fork. The Fork system call, it's getting a lot of attention these days, kind of in the news about, you know, Microsoft Research has this blog post about Fork. Um, Fork is one of those things that's not just a function you call, and then it does some things for you, and that's it. Um, fork tends to determine the shape of a lot of things in the API. A lot of things in the API have to interact with Fork, and Fork applies a lot of semantics that come along with Fork. Um, and so Fork, could we make Fork work in WebAssembly? It's a key part of POSIX, a lot of stuff is built on it. Um, and the answer is yes, it's possible. We can certainly imagine in a lot of engines how you could actually implement Fork. You basically copy a lot of stuff. Um, but this is not really how we want programs to work. This is not how we want actual people running code most of the time. And so if we just took the Debian user space and just poured it all over, or whatever it is, um, and it's all based on Fork, it's all based on the semantics of copying. And you can make copying go fast. This is what actual Unix systems do with copy and write and other techniques. Um, those techniques are harder to do in WASM engines. And there might be some engines that can actually pull it off. But we want a system that is really truly portable, that doesn't depend on being able to do clever tricks like use uh, the hardware-assisted copy on write. So we start looking at Fork, and closely connected to Fork is connected to processes, uh, the concept of the processes. Um, processes is also sort of a, a bigger thing here. They're in Unix, and they're all, you have a like process-like thing in, in Windows and other platforms. Um, but even processes, if we look at WebAssembly itself, the, the core spec, there's no process. There's no, there's instances, there's a store, but neither one of those exactly maps up to what a process is in, in Unix. Um, 
Um, some of the process things, um, talk about inner process communication, the P is process. Um, how do two processes talk to each other? And, and you know, all the existing platforms have lots of different ways between having serialized communication channels or shared memory communication channels. Um, and WASM has its own things. It has imports and exports, it has functions that can directly call each other. These are not things you can do in processes. And so if we, if we emulate, if we tell applications, we have processes, they won't make the full use of the platform. They won't make full use of the fact that we can just like synchronously call from one instance to another instance. Another big thing that's attached to processes is the concept of user. Of course, in Unix, you have like user group uh, concept and, and beyond user ID and group ID, you have like the factor of user ID and group effective group ID. So there's this, this kind of identity built into a process. And whenever a piece of code wants to do something, the OS will first ask, um, who are you doing this on behalf of? And then based on that user, it will make determination of whether or not that operation is supported or not. It's sort of the basic model. Um, and we can wrap additional um, sandboxing layers around that. That's kind of the basic model that's built into all of our system is, is the, the user the identity and who are you? The who are you question doesn't really fit into WebAssembly in a lot of the application you see we're looking at very well. Because you know, you're, you're downloading some code from the web perhaps, or you're, you're getting some code from some other place. Um, and if we think about it in terms of, I'm gonna run this code um, as my user, and, and, and by default, it's gonna do all the things that I can do. Um, except maybe then I'll, I'll additionally wrap around it because I don't totally trust it. I'll gonna wrap additional layer of sandboxing around that. Um, that's actually pretty complicated. And if you wanna do that portably, you wanna do that in a lot of different places, every kind of operating system has its own sandboxing techniques. That gets really complicated. Um, and so it doesn't really make sense to think about code as having an intrinsic identity in WebAssembly. Um, because identity is also a kind of a centralized concept. I mean, this code is coming in from the web. Um, it doesn't, it's, it's not you, it's not running on behalf of you. Um, it's just some code. And so that's really where the, the, the genesis for this idea of WASI comes up is, can we take the, the underlying core idea of security in WebAssembly, the core spec, the language, um, which starts from the point of a WebAssembly program can't do anything. It's just a bytecode. There's no IO instruction. There's no way of, of, of a memory mapped IO, control registers, none of that exists. All WASI can do to interact with the outside world is, is have imports and exports. Um, if you don't give any export, imports and exports, the default state of WebAssembly programs, they can't do anything. Um, and so we want WASI to start from that same place. The default for WebAssembly program that's using WASI that doesn't have any imports and exports can't do anything. Um, and then we're actually gonna take that same idea and generalize it into the dynamic API space and say, okay, even if you have some imports, you can't do anything until we pass you a capability object to say, okay, I'm gonna give you the permission to open this file. Um, and that really fits the use case for how we wanna run untrusted code. We wanna say, okay, I want you to run this program, read from this file and write to that file and don't do anything else. I don't want you to open up network connections. I don't want you looking at the rest of my file system. Um, and I shouldn't have to create a user and create a custom sandbox just to express this kind of operation. This is actually a pretty basic thing um, and being able to say just this file is input, just this file is output, also has a, a very strong resonance with the principle of, of least authority. We're not giving the program by default all permissions of a user, we're giving the program just the things it needs to do. This is one of the core ideas we want to establish with Posi is, is the capability model. You have an object, um, and an object also, we, we talk about objects and, and file descriptors sort of interchangeably. File descriptors are essentially capability objects only transposed into the space of, of integers so that you have um, C programs and C, C family language can, can talk to them. And so we really see WASI as taking the basic ideas of the core spec and extending them into the API space. And this is true in the security sense I just talked about, um, but we take this as far as we can go in every dimension. So we take this in terms of the, the standardization process. We're using a subgroup, which is very closely modeled after the core subgroup, the, the CG subgroup. And our approach to portability is very closely modeled after the, the both summary portability model of trying to minimize non-determinism. Um, of course, whenever you're talking about IO, there's gonna be a lot of non-determinism because you can't control the outside world. But we can certainly limit the scope and follow the core specs idea of, of limited and local non-determinism, um, which is also sometimes called um, uh, no spooky action at a distance. That's the, the, the principle that came up. And so security, the capability-based security model is one of the really basic things we want to do with, with, with WASI. Um, 
And this applies also, like I just talked about how it works with files, of having an object which represents an open file, much like a file, file descriptor. Um, but we can generalize this also to talk about network connections. Um, this isn't in WASA yet, but kind of one of the ideas is that we can, for any time you want to acquire a resource, um, the way you acquire a resource is not by calling out a particular name that you want, a file system path, a network host. Um, the way you acquire a resource is to take a capability that you've been given to acquire the resource and then ask through that resource to be granted additional resources. Uh, and so if you don't have any resources to start with, you can't request any additional ones, which, which gives us back to that original property of um, programs by default can't do anything. You have to have a capability object before you can do anything. That really is the model that allows us to have untrusted code in a really, really simple, easy to reason about method, without having to think about um, access control lists, that other kind of stuff. So access control, is how a lot of uh, traditional operating systems work. Um, DAC and MAC are discretionary access control. Matter, there's different kinds of access control. Um, and it all centers around this core idea of, of who is this? And is this, is this person identity permitted to access this resource? And if we have code running in contexts where there is no concept of identity of, of who is this code running on behalf of, um, these concepts don't, don't fit there. Capability model substitutes for that. Um, the capability model is not who are you, but what do you have? Essentially, we give you a token which allows you to access certain resources and nothing more, which allows us to sort of bypass the whole question of identity and identity management, which creates a bunch of complicated issues. We can also project the capability system into the file system. Um, and this is something that we get from, from Cloud ABI. It's also present in, in Fuchsia, this kind of system of taking directories and using directories as the basis for a capability. So you can handle someone a capability saying, I want to give you access to the bar directory in this example. Um, and underneath bar, there's some files, red and green. And so that capability would grant you the access to request additional capabilities for the things inside that directory. So directories sort of act as, as capability containers in that sense. This is a really nice system. It's not a, it's not a perfectly fine green system, um, but it's a very intuitive system. And very intuitive systems that, that users and system integrators and other people can understand um, is a very powerful thing. Um, another dimension that we can customize in is the concept of rights. So within a file descriptor or a capability object, um, when you say, here you have access to this file, um, it's not just a blanket access to this file. We can talk about different things you can do with a file. Um, and so within the API, we actually have a bitmap of all the different rights, different operations you can do with a file. Um, obviously, things like read and write are sort of the two important ones. I can give you read-only access to a file, or I can give you write-only access to a file. Um, or even, even control things like, are you allowed to move around the position within a file, or even read back where you are in the file. Uh, this also extends to directories. And so with, this, with the system of writes, you can actually have things like you can describe um, a directory containing log files and give an application the permission to append to log files within a directory, but not read their existing context. Uh, contents or, or even overwrite their existing contents. You can basically set up the flag saying, within this directory, you have permission to open files for append um, and not seek and not read, but just append. So you can describe that within the capability systems. You can actually get quite fine grained control over exactly what you're allowing applications to do. Um, additional things that we're kind of covering in the, in the current, what we call WASI core, uh, random numbers. Um, this is actually pretty, pretty primitive right now. Random numbers is a complex topic. There's a lot of questions that we haven't tackled yet concerning, like, what if you're running on a VM and the system doesn't have any entropy yet? Um, it, should it block? Should it return an error? Um, those are good questions. Um, another good question to ask with random numbers is, what if you want to have a fully deterministic WASM instance, which a lot of people do? Um, and that really introduces this concept of modularity, that one of the big things we're going to do probably pretty soon, judging by the, the size of the committee, um, is, is split up the WASI, what we currently call WASI core, which kind of has a bunch of stuff in it, into separate modules so that individual VMs can implement parts of it, not other parts. So with random numbers, for example, if you want to have a fully deterministic system, um, it's, it's actually important to just fully make them unavailable instead of having them there and having them fail, because if they have them there and have them fail, um, can actually lead applications to assume that they have random numbers when they don't. So we're going to make these modular. And by modular, I also mean modular in the WebAssembly API sense. So WebAssembly imports have a concept of a module and a field in that module. And so that module will identify um, the random number functionality. And then within that, you'll identify functions to call. Um, 
Same story with clocks. Clocks tell you what time it is or tell you how much time has elapsed, different things. Um, and again, here again, if you want to have um, determinism or if you want to be resistant to timing attacks of certain kinds, perhaps not all kinds, um, you can take clocks and put them in a separate module and then uh, VMs that don't wish to have, provide that functionality can, can not provide that module. Um, but having clocks in the overall API is just a useful thing so that people who do want to expose a concept of time can do so with a standard interface. Networking is something that WASI today doesn't do a lot with, um, but there is the, the sort of kernel of a core idea with networking, which is that we want to split apart opening resources, acquiring new, new capability objects with accessing resources. So if you think about like file systems, the, the four basic things you can do with files, open, close, read, write, um, which of these things is not like the other? Open is the special one. Open is the one where everything gets interesting because in open, you have to name the thing you're asking for you have to say what kind of access you want to have. Um, and when you talk about the networking domain, send and receive are basically read and write. Um, but then for creating a new kind of network connection, um, if you look at like the, the, the Berkeley Sockets API has, has socket, bind, connect, accept, listen, and each of those has a whole bunch of parameters. It's actually pretty complicated to create a network thing. But once you've created it, then reading and writing is actually really simple. Um, and I think it'll actually be possible to unify the reading and writing between networks uh, network sockets and files so that we can have sort of a, a core IO API is what I'm sort of picturing what this can evolve into um, that deals with reading and writing and doesn't necessarily even have to care what it's reading or what it's writing. Um, and then separate modules for opening files, opening network connections, um, and opening other kinds of connections. You know, anything could fit into this read and write paradigm, whether it's a modem or a Unix domain socket, lots of different things can be made to fit into this domain. And a lot of code doesn't have to care about what it's talking to as long as it's a, like a stream of bytes or a stream of datagrams, um, you can sort of fit into this read and write model. So the open will be in a separate module, and the access will be in a core I.O. module. It's kind of one of the, the big ideas we have here. So this is sort of a rough, rough overview of, of what WASI has right now. Um, file system, very minimal support for networking, although it's not, not really even enough to use at this point. Um, but there will be more coming. Uh, random numbers and clocks. Uh, looking forward. The future is really, really big. There's going to be a lot of stuff coming in WASI. Um, we actually kind of worried about when we release WASI if we're releasing it too early because there's not even enough functionality in it yet. Um, but we think the core stuff right now is enough to express the basic vision we have, which is really important. So we can start the people process because the people process is almost more important than the technology at this point. Um, setting up the stage for having uh, the appropriate governance within the CG subgroup is actually one of the core goals we have. So within that, some of the features we could add, full networking support. Um, there's an idea out there that, that Red Hat has about this thing called TLS SOC, which is like a, a SOC is like API that to the extent possible handles um, things like setting up a TLS connection for you. Um, and I'm really excited about that because the prospect of having a TLS socket that does all the TLS stuff for you with a basic sockets API means it could fit into this basic vision of having a read and write interface that can be generic over any kind of socket, including encrypted sockets, um, and then handling the details of actually negotiating the TLS connection um, in a separate module. Um, and then there could be arbitrary amounts of complexity there. But once you have the thing set up, then it can just be a rewrite interface, and you can unify that with other stuff. Um, async IO is a really cool topic to talk about. Um, and there's a lot of interesting possibilities here. I'm really excited for the possibility of porting libuv to WASI at some point. I don't think we have the features to do it really well right now. Um, but asking the question of how can we do this really well is going to be one of the really important things. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert in this stuff. I've, I've learned a lot about ePoll and, and KQs over the last few months. Um, and, and now there's this new thing called IOU ring. There's a lot of stuff going on in the space. Um, I think Wazi's going to have to do something because it's really important. Um, I don't know what it is yet. There is a really, really big idea that I think it's really, really important that can fit into the async story potentially, which is the idea of splitting programs and directors and commands. And one of the underlying things here is that APIs aren't just about functions that you can call or data that you can access or objects you can read. Um, it's all about how other things can call you and, and how other things can access your data. And so we talk about commands are programs that are shaped like you have a main function, call the main function, it runs, it ends, and the program is done. And that's how a lot of programs today are written, is like there's a main function. Even if inside the program, the main function is just running an event loop. Um, 
the way the programming languages are structured today is you have a main function that calls an event loop that stays on the stack. But with reactors, there's this idea of, oh, that we could have a reactor API where a program could be structured without a main, um, and the program just kind of gets loaded into memory and can register callbacks, and then the VM can call it with callbacks. This model is really interesting for us because it could fit into browsers on the browser main thread. It's one possibility for it. But another possibility is that it might be also a way of abstracting over different platform async APIs. So I talked about ePoll. Um, every kind of operating system has its own kind of way of doing async IO. It's something that POSIX never actually covered. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the applications for WASI and where we see WASI going. There's a lot of interest in WASI, a lot of things it can do um, from servers. Um, we hear today from, from Docker, they have some interesting ideas. Um, we also see use cases in, in very small devices, um, blockchains, application plugins. Um, and kind of a common theme through all of this stuff is that we see WASM having a lot of places in infrastructure of just being this, this bit of code that you can stick into something where you need to have it be fundamentally portable because you don't want to expose what the thing is running on is. Um, it needs to be secure because we're going to build this into infrastructure in a lot of places. Um, we think Wasm is actually a really good fit for this all kind of infrastructure like this. Um, and it's also really important when you have infrastructure like this, that the infrastructure be managed by an open process, which is why we've set up the CG subgroup so that there's no single company that tries to capture the value of WebAssembly. We're going to set up a CG subgroup so that we all participate together and work on this together and make the best Wasm we can for everyone to build on top of. Mobile apps, desktop apps are popular topics. People like them a lot. Um, I, was, I was talking with some other people that sometimes I think my job in Wawazi is going to be to say no. That's going to be the most important thing that I do is, is to say no. Um, and it's not that we won't ever do these things. Um, I think Wasm will, will do mobile apps and desktop apps at some point. Um, and certainly there's different, there's different levels of this. If you look at just like a game that just needs to have some compute and then draw into some kind of a graphics buffer, um, that's not too hard to imagine. But for the full range of, of what people call mobile applications today, what people expect in mobile applications today, um, there's a lot of functionality. Um, and so we talk about WebAssembly as a platform, looks like it's this great thing, but the APIs matter. And the API service area to do a really good mobile app or a really good desktop app is huge. And so realistically, um, I estimate 2% of the work is done. Um, Wazi can absolutely do the rest of 98%. It's just not going to happen on a very fast time scale, realistically speaking. Um, some people are experimenting with operating systems. Um, Mozilla actually sponsored the, the Nebulet operating system GSOC last summer uh, because we think it's an interesting stuff to experiment with. At this point, operating systems look like they're just experiments. Uh, and I have an operating system experiment because you could already take WASI and you could already run it on an operating system. You could have a regular standard OS kernel and you could run a VM on top of it and you could run WASI on top of that. And so the task for WASI right now, there's a big enough task. The thing that we really think is important to focus on is making sure that WASI is a standard for everyone to use. Um, then when it comes time, if we decide that we want to optimize this and say, okay, having an OS, running a VM, running WASI is three parts. What if we combine the VM and the OS? Can we make it faster? Can we make it use less memory? And the answer might be yes. There's a lot of potential gains we could have there. But that will be an optimization that we can look at. Right now, the key thing with WASI is setting up the core foundation for a lot of other things to be built on. Um, we also expect that WASI programs will run on the web in a variety of forms. Um, there's currently a fairly primitive JavaScript polyfill um, for WASI. Um, it's kind of in a proof of concept stage right now, and people are kind of trying to figure out, you know, how would this fit in? If we wanted to run WASI programs in, in some kind of production way, um, what can we do with this polyfill? How far can it go? Should we rewrite the polyfill, do other things with polyfill? There's a lot of questions there. Um, in the long term, we can also talk about what would it mean for WASI to run natively on the web. Right now, things like synchronous I.O. make that pretty hard to imagine.
what I'm most excited about of all the different things we look at doing this is new kind of application platforms. People ask about things like, you know, is, is, is Wasm going to be the new Electron or the new Node or the new other things? Um, I don't think it's going to be exactly any of those things. I think we're going to see Wasm do new things we haven't done before. And that's really what I'm most excited about is seeing what, what it turns into. So what can you do with WASI today? Uh, a quick slide on this because um, a lot of this content is, is already covered pretty well on the web. If you go and read about stuff, you can do C++, C, C++ Rust, AssemblyScript. Um, other languages out there now, um, Zig and others are out there. Um, a lot of languages. I'm actually going to cover it a lot right now because you can actually go and find out a lot better information on the web um, in, in each of these languages' um, respective web pages. As I talked about before, the basic capabilities you have are basic file system access, you know, clocks, random numbers, um, command line options, environment variables are sort of the set of things you can do right now. And it turns out, not entirely coincidentally, that that's basically the set of things you need to do to write test cases for compilers. <laughs> Which is sort of the self-serving use case for it, but um, that actually is really useful because it means we can actually bring along a lot of test suites uh, for both compilers and for libraries. We can test a lot of things so we can get the foundation really solid even if it isn't the most rich application platform for all use cases. Um, this will actually be a really good foundation for us um, to build a solid foundation to build on. WebAssembly beyond the browser, it needs an API. And that API is WASI. We actually have a few minutes if you want to do questions for Dan. And what I'll do is I'll run around. So if you raise your hand, I will take the mic to you. Yes, question. Go ahead. So WASI doesn't have, um, at least right now, doesn't have things like processes. But the idea of having like processes is baked into a lot of language. So for instance, in Rust, we see like standard process. Um, so is there a roadmap for either translating those to WASI or not supporting them or, or what? Um, so easy answer, there's no roadmap yet. Um, we're still trying to figure out what that means. Um, I expect that Rust will have to adapt, it's it's what I expect. Okay. And this is part of the, the long-term thinking. Instead of thinking in terms of, let's, let's emulate what people are used to having, um, which is making things easy. This is an easy versus simple description. Making things easy um, versus basically saying, look, we really don't have processes. Are the things you're doing actually tied to processes, or are the things you're doing something that you could do in other ways, you could affect in other ways? Um, and I expect we're going to have to bubble up some requirements saying, okay, force yourself to think outside the process box and figure out other ways to do what you're doing is, is my guess of what's going to happen. I don't actually have a roadmap. Do you see the possibility that um, we might have a model similar to, say, Kronos and OpenGL, where uh, there are extensions that are sort of developed independently by groups and then sort of moved into a standard as, uh, as, as it's sort of proven out. Yeah, that could easily happen. I mean, we already split out WASI into a subgroup of the WebAssembly CG. Um, and it's possible, like, if we end up having very domain-specific things like graphics, um, those could end up being sort of not in scope for the rest of the WASI group. Is, is could easily happen. And so there could be a role for um, either a Kronos like organization or a sub-subgroup. We can, we can kind of make whatever. Uh, makes sense, but um, I think that's a little ways out. We haven't quite gotten there yet, and we'll figure it out as we go. Probably last question. That's a great talk. Um, so you very briefly touched upon the async story for WASI um, with the possibility of potentially um, porting libuv. Um, at the WASI layer, but um, if I understand correctly, WebAssembly itself, at least the core spec, doesn't really have any sort of um, async story or threads or, you know, um, any of these primitives. Um, so I was kind of wondering, um, 
I was I was kind of wondering at which layer would like something like async support um, be best suited to add like WebAssembly itself or something like WASI, which is like you know a Libc interface to you know that sits on top of um, WebAssembly. That's a great question, and I don't know the answer. I don't know the best place to put it. I can say that WASI um, as an API is one thing. WASI as a standardization effort is sort of a, a dual thing that goes with it. In the standardization effort, we could look at um, if we find it's appropriate adding features into the core WASM spec or, or even defining an extension to the core spec in some form. Um, if, if we feel that that's, that's the best way to do async IO, those are certainly in scope that the WASI community subgroup can do. Um, that would then you'd build on top of that with the API. It wouldn't strictly be part of the API. Uh, so I think all those things are in scope. We can figure out what we want to do. Uh, the big question right now is what do we want to do? Um, and that's kind of this, this big open space that um, I know I'm, I'm sort of like scrambling right now to, to get, my, get up to speed on async APIs because that's not my background. Um, so I'm trying to learn about it because it's really important. Um, and I know there's a lot of people that actually do know a lot about the stuff. And so we're working on bringing people in and trying to figure out like, let's bring in some expertise. Um, let's get yeah. the community together, find people who want to talk about this stuff and you know, figure out what the right thing to do is. Cool. All right, thank you, Dan. A round of applause one more time.